Hi, thank you for joining this webinar. Um, I'm Katie Johnson, one of the Maternal Fetal Medicine Fellows at BI in Boston, and I'm gonna be giving this talk on elective induction of labor. And just a, a note, most of this uh, lecture or webinar focuses on the ARRIVE trial, and so I'll be talking about indications for elective induction of labor and kind of the process, um, but not so much the different methods for um, performing an induction of labor. I have no conflicts of interest, although I have to say I do inductions all the time and myself have also undergone induction, so that maybe colors some of what I'm gonna talk about. But this trial that I wanted to focus on uh, got a lot of attention about a year ago when it was published in August of 2018. And it was a trial that also had kind of been introduced at the SMFM meeting several months earlier, but these are a few headlines from after the, the trial was published from the Washington Post and the New York Times, and kind of some of the major messages that were being sent to people in the lay press was that induction of labor may have um, improved maternal outcomes, and specifically that C-sections may be less likely when you induce selectively at 39 weeks. As you can imagine, this study and you know, was getting attention in the lay press, but also there were a lot of people in the Twitter world that were commenting on the trial. So I wanted to highlight a couple different sides of the, um, the impressions that people got. And so this is one from a OB uh, that demonstrated that the ARRIVE trial maybe showcased some blind spots in OB research, that a disempowering birth has lasting consequences for family, doing more interventions to result in less intervention is a paradox, and achieving certainty for the system is less important than shared decisions with patients, kind of implying that you know, doing inductions, which is a medical intervention, doesn't totally make sense in terms of being patient-centered or um, doesn't make sense necessarily in terms of some of the outcomes they were um, reporting in the trial. Another kind of voice in the Twitter world was from Brett Anderson, an MFM in Utah, and so his was sort of an opposite take um, in that, you know, sort of recognizing the criticism of the ARRIVE trial maybe didn't ring true, um, and that historically we actually have limited options for women um, at term because of the idea that induction increases the risk of C-section, which the trial was kind of countering. There was also responses in many different other um, venues and from different um, groups. And so this is a part of an infographic that was published from the sort of natural um, childbirth or sort of mindful childbirth group. Um, and you can kind of look this up online to get the full scoop, but many people were interested in making sure that patients understood um, what the trial was and was not demonstrating and to who it may or may not apply, um, kind of indicating that potentially people who desire natural childbirth or um, maybe wouldn't have otherwise chosen an elective induction may not really want to um, undergo an induction. So in this talk, these are the objectives. I wanted to define prior knowledge about pregnancy outcomes after induction of labor at term, specifically among low-risk women. Um, to review the ARRIVE trial, which generated all those responses that I just went through, um, to analyze the implications of the ARRIVE trial for patients and providers, and to kind of think about how to apply the findings of the ARRIVE trial to a labor and delivery unit. And then finally, I wanted to discuss counseling with respect to the choice of induction versus expected management for low-risk patients at 39 weeks. This is my outline, which mirrors the objectives. And so to start with some more background, um, as kind of pregnancy advances, the fetal mortality rate does increase. It's overall very, very low, and you can see there's kind of two um, peaks early on in the second trimester, and then as you go beyond 42 weeks. Um, and so this is one thing to keep in mind, but there's also morbidity the earlier you deliver patients. And so there's a lot of studies out there demonstrating that delivery prior to 39 weeks is not benign and associated with NICU admissions, with respiratory complications, and really it seems to nadir around 39 weeks, which is what this graph from, from the paper is showing. 
So we, we try, if we can, to avoid induction of labor without medical indication less than 39 weeks. And we tend to recommend induction of labor greater than 42 weeks because of that rising kind of fetal mortality that I demonstrated with recommendations from our governing bodies for considering induction greater than 41 weeks. But what about this time period of between 39 and 41 weeks? Um, we don't have as much data about neonatal outcomes at that point. And then there's this other point of whether induction increases cesarean rate. Conventional wisdom and what many of us have been taught is yes, and even in the current ACOG practice bulletin, there's a statement in which we should counsel women about the twofold increased risk of cesarean delivery with an unripe cervix. But many of the studies upon which recommendations like this were made used a comparison group of spontaneously laboring women. So they were really comparing induction of labor versus spontaneous labor. But spontaneous labor isn't something that one can really choose. It's not something that we have so much control over, whereas the proper comparison group really for observational studies and, and in general for induction of labor is really expectant management. So when we compare outcomes among people who were induced versus expectantly managed, then we can really get a sense of what the true kind of actual risks of um, induction of labor are and what the true outcomes are. Um, and so there was a meta-analysis meta that was published actually after the RCT kind of to demonstrate what maybe um, outcomes might be in, in, observational, in observational studies outside of a clinical trial. But I thought this was good to kind of illustrate some of the studies that had come before the RCT that I'll focus on in a little while. And so all of these studies use the comparison group of expectant management. And um, they have various numbers of people and some restrictions of the study population, which is demonstrated in this slide. Um, and this is a forest plot. So the way to read this, um, the, the primary outcome they focused on was risk of cesarean delivery. And so um, you have each of the studies on the left-hand side of the screen, and they uh, kind of included all these studies and in the meta-analysis came up with um, a risk ratio for risk of cesarean delivery overall, and then sort of demonstrated it in the plot to the right. Um, so if the you know, square or triangle or square or diamond falls to the left, then that favors induction, meaning that the risk of cesarean delivery was lower with induction, mm -hmm. and to the right favors expectant management. So you can see for all of these observational studies that um, the risk of cesarean delivery was lower in those that were induced compared to expected management. So now we come to the ARRIVE trial and really, um, so I'm gonna go through kind of the methods here, but the background and the impetus for this trial was to understand what some of the neonatal outcomes were when you compared those who were induced versus those who were expectantly managed at 39 weeks. This was published, as I said, in the New England Journal of Medicine a, a little over a year ago. It was a multi-center randomized trial. It was unmasked, so people knew which group they were in. They included low-risk, nulliparous, singleton vertex pregnancies and there were no contraindications to vaginal delivery. I wanna stress again that this was just amongst people who had not had a prior delivery. They excluded participants who lacked reliable dating or if there were any medical indications for induction. And there's a long list of exclusion criteria that's in the supplementary material for the, for the study if anyone is interested. Um, they also, at the time of randomization, excluded anyone who had labor, premature rupture of membranes, or vaginal bleeding. So randomization occurred prior to the actual induction. Um, and so at 38 to 38 and six weeks, if any of these things were happening, then they were not actually included. The intervention group was the labor induction group from 39 to 39 and four weeks gestation, so people underwent induction during that time period. 
with the comparison being expected management, meaning they did not undergo induction during that time period and no induction prior to 40 and five weeks. But everyone was, they may ultimately have had an induction for other reasons or by 42 and two weeks. The primary outcome was a composite of perinatal death or severe neonatal complications. And secondary outcomes included cesarean delivery and other maternal complications. This was a study that was done at 41 academic and community-based hospitals. Um, they didn't, they kind of used whatever protocol was done at those hospitals, but did specify a couple things, including that if the Bishop score was less than five, then cervical ripening should be done, but they didn't specify how exactly to do this. It was however the hospital normally did it. And then they also specified that 12 hours after rupture of membranes and oxytocin should pass before declaring a failed induction. The power calculation for determining you know, how many people were included in the study was based on an expected rate of the primary outcome of 3.5%. And they felt that it would be clinically relevant if the outcome was 40% lower in the induction group versus the expected management group. And so came up with um, 6,000 people as the number that they needed for the study to have enough power to find a difference in the primary outcome that was clinically relevant. The analysis was intention to treat. And they did do an interim analysis as part of this study. And so I just want to point out that the p-value used to determine statistical significance was 0 0.046, which is different from what we generally think of as statistically significant of less than 0 0.05, and that just becomes important for the results. This is a flow chart of those who were included in the study. So about 50,000 women were assessed for eligibility can see that 44,000 were excluded and 27,600 did not meet eligibility criteria and about 16,000 declined to participate. This left about 6,000 or 6,100 women for randomization. And you can see that they were um, assigned to the different groups as follows with very good follow-up rates. We look at their table one, which goes over different maternal characteristics. I've just highlighted a few things. So in the population included in the study, the average or the median age was um, about 23, 24 in the different groups um, with a BMI of about 30. And obviously there was a range that's seen there in the, um, in the chart. You can see their racial breakdown as well. And as expected for a randomized controlled trial, um, the, there was an essentially equal amount of people in different racial groups and about equal age and BMI and all the other characteristics. This um, chart demonstrates the primary outcome, which was again, the neonatal composite outcome. And so um, you can see the percentage of the outcome in each group. And so there was 4.3% had the primary outcome in the induction group and 5.4% had it in the expectant management group. And when they did the statistical analysis, this was not actually statistically significant. So um, it was determined that the primary outcome occurred about the same in each group. When we look at the different components of the primary outcome, I've listed just a few there, including perinatal death, which was equal in the group, two groups and very low, um, need for respiratory support, meconium aspiration syndrome, and birth trauma, so just a couple of different ones. You can see that probably the primary outcome is mostly driven by the need for respiratory support, at least in this study. And that actually was less common in the induction group compared to the expectant management group. When we looked at maternal outcomes, um, this lists just a, couple, a few key ones that I pulled out. But you can see the cesarean delivery rate is uh, with 19% in the induction group and 22% in the expectant management group. So we did find that, or in this study, they found that there was a lower 
cesarean delivery rate in the induction group. The, the other difference between the groups was in hypertensive disorders. And so as may be expected in the induction group, there was a lower uh, in incidence of hypertensive disorders, 9% versus 14%. There was not a difference in postpartum hemorrhage or operative vaginal deliveries between the groups. Here I've highlighted just a few other, I think, important maternal outcomes. And so um, duration of stay on labor and delivery in hours is listed for the different groups. And um, so there was a longer stay as may be expected for those in the induction group. 20 hours um, was the median versus 14 hours with a range. The labor agentry scale was a, is a measure, a standardized or validated uh, questionnaire that looks at people's sense of control um, and satisfaction with their labor course. And that actually was higher in the induction group. I um, can look at the numbers there and they may or may not be clinically really that different, but slightly higher labor agentry scale in the induction group. And um, in terms of labor pain, slightly higher in the expectant group versus the induction group. But again, um, whether the numbers are actually that different from each other is questionable. It's just statistically they were. This chart goes over a couple of different uh, planned secondary analyses or kind of sub groups that were uh, clinically important. And so um, the way to read this chart is um, on the left, they list out kind of the, the subgroup um, and different categories. Include, so they looked at race, modified Bishop score, BMI, and age. And then on the right, you can see the relative risk. And they, um, if the boxes fall to the left, it really favored induction, meaning a lower risk of whatever, lower risk of um, cesarean delivery is what I'm highlighting here um, compared to expectant, whereas if it falls to the right, then it favors expectant management. So there was a lower um, rate of cesarean delivery if it falled to the right. So you can see that most of, in most of the groups, the boxes actually fall to the left. So even amongst all of the different subgroups, induction still um, conferred a lower risk of cesarean delivery. And that's specifically pointing out that it didn't really matter what the Bishop score was and it didn't matter what one's BMI or age was, that you still had a lower risk of cesarean delivery in the induction group versus expectant management group. I'm just highlighting that here. I do, however, want to point out that if you look at the overall cesarean delivery rate with these different groups, that um, that the cesarean delivery rate was higher in those with a modified Bishop score and was higher in those with a higher BMI and higher age. It's just that in, in the induction group compared to expected management group, you had lower rates. So we still know that people in these different groups have higher chances of cesarean delivery at baseline, but that whether they're induced or undergo expected management, it's still gonna be higher, but there was a lower rate in the induction group in this study. So just to summarize a couple of key findings, there was no difference in the risk of adverse perinatal outcomes in the induction group versus expectant management group. I've listed the risk ratio there. And again, it was not a statistically significant difference. And induction was associated with a lower frequency of cesarean delivery and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. When we look at the difference in cesarean delivery, if you think about um, how many people you would need to induce to prevent a C-section, that's the number needed to treat, it would be 28. There was a higher overall cesarean delivery rate in certain subgroups, but they were still lower in the induction group. So even amongst those with a lower Bishop score, um, they still had lower rates of cesarean delivery compared to those in the expectant management group. And there was more time spent on labor and delivery for induction with an average increase of six hours. So now I wanna go over the response to ARRIVE. And so many different 
you know, governing bodies put out recommendations or position statements. And so SMFM put out one um, in which it would be reasonable to offer elective induction of labor to low-risk malleparous women at or beyond 39 weeks of gestation, but that they recommend that providers who choose this approach uh, include women who meet eligibility criteria of the ARRIVE trial. It's kind of one of the major points they wanted to get across with the recommendation. Um, and they you know, go on with the rest of the bullet points there to recommend against offering elective induction of labor to women under circumstances inconsistent with the ARRIVE study protocol, unless performed as part of a research protocol, and that further research should be conducted to measure the impact of this practice on settings other than a clinical trial. So the meta-analysis I kind of pointed out earlier, one of the purposes was to see kind of in observational data, you know, outside of a clinical trial with these um, would these findings still apply? And they were actually quite consistent, but in general, potentially more research is needed. ACOG put out a practice advisory stating that it would be reasonable for obstetricians and healthcare facilities to offer induction of labor to the group studied in the ARRIVE trial. And that, um, you know, consider consideration of electin induction should not only take into account the trial findings, but also the values and preferences of the pregnant woman. And that it's critical that personnel and facilities coordinate policies related to offering of elective induction of labor, primarily because of the more intense resources necessary to provide induction. Um, in terms of a midwifery response, um, this is just a headline that the ACNM um, acknowledge the quality of the study, but raise concerns about the potential for misapplying the results. And from a nursing perspective, A1 put out a position statement that kind of went through a couple of things um, that were a slightly different view than what was presented in the ASMF or ACOG recommendations, but really stressed that labor is a complex physiologic event that involves an intricate interaction of multiple hormones and women can make fully informed decisions about induction of labor only when they understand the process of induction, the potential benefits, and the risks. So I had previously at my institution kind of sent out a survey to providers about, you know, what they were doing and how they were um, kind of thinking about their arrived trial results and potentially applying them to their population. And so these are just some informal uh, survey results that I got. So I asked, has ARRIVE changed your counseling about induction of labor? And most people at the time that I sent out the survey said, no, it hadn't, but some did. So I asked, you know, well, if it's changed your counseling, how? And so many people said that now we consider it a reasonable option and allow it if someone asks for it. Um, they kind of cited the trial as something that they could reference for those who were nervous about induction, as it was reassuringly didn't have an increase in C-section rates. And that now that for those that did mention it, um, it was something they talked about with their patients, but also explained who the trial applied to. When I asked whether this was something that people discussed with all, some, or none of their patients, Say the majority said none at that time. Um, some said some, said some. Um, and for those that did discuss it with some of their patients, it was those who requested induction of labor. And I also asked, should all patients without a medical or fetal indication be offered induction of labor at 39 weeks selectively? And there was mixed results. So people had different opinions about this. And I'm sure for those listening, you may or may not have different opinions from the population I surveyed, but just wanted to give a sense of at least a group of people I surveyed previously. So now I wanted to turn to the patient perspective. And, you know, there were some patient level outcomes that were looked at um, or patient kind of satisfaction outcomes in the ARRIVE trial, primary, primarily the labor agent tree scale. Um, and that would imply that there was a high degree of satisfaction in the ARRIVE trial for those included, whether they were in the induction or the expected management group. But we also have to remember that the people, that those who were enrolled in the study were willing to be randomized. 
and that about 70% of those who were eligible actually declined to participate. So yes, there was a high degree of satisfaction even in the induction group, but these were also a, a special kind of group of people that decided to be enrolled in a randomized control trial. And so why someone declined to participate is, you know, could be for many different reasons, but potentially it could be that they didn't want to be randomized. So I kind of looked at different ways of, or to see what was published out there about how women think about induction. You know, I do inductions all the time. I kind of know what I talk to about people, but sort of, um, it's also interesting to kind of think about what our patients are hearing from us and what they're experiencing. Um, and this listening to mothers survey is just kind of a nationwide survey that um, looks at people's perspectives um, at all different points in pregnancy and postpartum. And so just a couple quotes, but this person said, I kept pushing to have an induced labor because during my pregnancy, I was miserable and in pain with horrible migraines. I had a healthy pregnancy and did not see why it would be a problem to induce labor. Another person said, I think caregivers are too quick to induce labor once a mother hits 39 weeks because it's more convenient for them. I think they're more concerned with their schedule than the health and well-being of the mother and baby. So you can see that people kind of are coming into the process with very different perspectives. And so some people want to be induced and other people don't. It's just important to understand where patients are coming from. Also from this data, um, just a couple attitudes that I felt were relevant. Um, more than half of first-time moms felt that birth should not be interfered with unless medically necessary. Um, and most people did feel that the quality of U.S. maternity care was good or excellent. This was a study that looked at perceptions, expectations, and satisfaction with induced labor. It was a questionnaire-based study. They looked at perceptions, expectations, and experiences in women being induced and those presenting in spontaneous labor. So questionnaires were completed prior to induction in the induced group and post-delivery in both of the groups. They included people who were, um, had a singleton pregnancy more than 37 weeks gestation, an indication for induction in this particular group, and a Bishop score less than eight. They excluded induction for prom or significant maternal fetal concerns necessitating continuous monitoring. So not exactly the same population that we're talking about from the ARRIVE trial, but just you know people coming in for induction for some other reason. So some of the themes from um, the data um, among the group undergoing induction were that it's important to get as much information about the induction prior to the process. One in three were not satisfied with the information they got. One in four were not satisfied with their degree of involvement and 40% felt induction took longer than expected. And I think this last point is one that we can all kind of um, identify with and that many people do not expect induction to take the time it does. So from all of that data, I felt some of the themes were that many people do not want induction unless it's absolutely needed, although definitely there are some people who do. And people may not be adequately informed about the process of induction. And that kind of goes back to the AWAN statement that you can only really make an informed decision once you understand the process. And labor is a pretty complex process, as is induction. So now I wanted to talk about the system perspective. There was a cost effectiveness analysis published after the ARRIVE trial, and I know there's others that are kind of in the process of being published, but haven't yet been published. So this is the one that has been published and I'll go through it. Um, and so in this cost effectiveness analysis, they kind of took a theoretical cohort of 1.6 million women and compared a strategy of induction of labor for all versus expectant management. The model that they put together was derived from the literature and uh, some of the outcomes primarily from the ARRIVE trial. So one of their um, main outcomes and kind of using baseline estimates for the cost effectiveness analysis, they found that there was um, a cost effectiveness ratio of 87,692 
which is below what is typically used for the quality threshold. So typically if something costs $100,000 or less, it's considered cost effective. And so this was based on baseline estimates from the literature, marginally cost effective. They also estimated that an additional $2 billion of healthcare spending um, would be required in the US if, again, there was a strategy of induction for all. Um, just in terms of cost effectiveness analyses, one of the most important steps of doing the analysis is are, are actually the sensitivity analyses. So the model derives baseline estimates from the literature, but as we know, there's these estimates for some of the important variables can change depending on your population or institution. So this was one of the sensitivity analyses they did, um, which looked at cost of induction of labor. And so um, the dashed line at 100,000 indicates the quality threshold um, and below that are all the different scenarios in which the um, strategy of induction for all would be cost effective. Um, you can see that as cost of induction of labor goes up, the um, ICER um, actually goes up as well. For expectant management, as we would expect, it doesn't because they're undergoing expectant management and not induction of labor. Um, and so at some point, and, and based on a certain cost of induction of labor, it crosses and becomes no longer cost effective. So cost of induction of labor is one important variable. This chart looks at the rate of cesarean in each of the different groups. So on the induction of labor group versus the expectant management group. And we know that the rate of cesarean can vary based on your population or institution. So the way to kind of look at this chart is that if the um, result or if the, you know, your intersection of, it, of the rate of cesarean falls in the red, then induction for all was cost effective. If it falls in the blue area, then expected management was cost effective. The star on the chart are the baseline estimates from the ARRIVE trial. So 22% rate of cesarean in the expected management group um, and 90% rate induction of labor group. But as that varies, you may, um, as the different rates of cesarean in different groups vary, you may get different results in terms of whether, some, whether the induction for all is cost effective or not. So in conclusion, from the cost effectiveness analysis, induction of labor was cost effective in 65% of scenarios. The model was highly sensitive to cost of induction of labor, rates of cesarean delivery in each group, and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And so cost effectiveness may vary based on the institutional policies and patient population. And just a note about the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, if you have a higher rate of, in, of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, then induction would be more cost effective. So just important to consider your own population, your own institution, in order to determine whether a policy of an elective induction model would be cost effective or not. Some other additional considerations, just from a systems perspective, include nursing staffing. So with many inductions, um, uh, continuous monitoring is often recommended or done. And so that just increases the needs for nursing staffing. And then also important to consider what the marginal benefit of the intervention is. So as I had stated before, to prevent one cesarean delivery, you need to do 28 inductions. But the number needed to treat for use of, a, of continuous labor support, like a doula, is actually just 14. So when we're thinking about how to uh, decrease the cesarean delivery rate, it may be that elective induction is not necessarily the answer to that, but there may be other ways of decreasing the cesarean delivery rate that require less resources. And also how induction and labor are managed is important to consider and may vary depending on institution. I wanted to just to bring up some other things that I'm people may have questions about or are thinking about, and these are alternatives to inpatient inductions. As we saw, there's more time spent on labor and delivery for those undergoing inductions, and, and a lot of this may be actually um, time spent with cervical ripening. So as people think about how to potentially apply the results of ARRIVE to their populations, kind of thinking about ways to move the cervical ripening off of labor and delivery may be one strategy. 
And so people have looked at the use of Foley balloon as an outpatient. Also some institutions do prostaglandins as outpatients. Um, and also just thinking about different areas in the hospital that are not on labor and delivery. Prostaglandins have more risks to them. So when thinking about a, you know, really institutionalizing this or coming up with protocols, there's been more focus actually on the use of Foley balloon. And this is um, just a flow chart for a potential protocol that was published by Levine et al. Um, who've done a lot of work on induction of labor. Um, and so outpatient Foley is a nice option because there's less risks associated with its use. And so um, less potential monitoring needed and um, kind of considered an overall safe method to use outpatient. Um, it's also overall pretty good satisfaction amongst patients who elect to undergo it. And so this is a protocol, again, for potentially applying the results um, or applying this protocol to different institutions. I have to say we, we are not doing this, at least at the BI. I think one of the groups um, here maybe looking into it, but we're not actually doing this. I just wanted to give it an, as an example for what other folks are doing. So you, know, you check the vital signs, your cervical exam. Um, if anything's abnormal in terms of the NST, then they wouldn't be a candidate for outpatient. We place the Foley balloon and monitor people for two hours. And if anything's abnormal, then they would stay on labor and delivery. But if not, then potentially they could go home and um, given are given return precautions. And you know, this isn't um, what's demonstrated or what's presented here is not something that has been kind of studied in an RCT, but really just kind of expert opinion about best practices. So I wanted to present some of um, what I've thought about in terms of how to apply ARRIVE to BI just with our actual cohort of deliveries. And one thing I just to point out that's relevant wherever you're trying to apply this, the findings of the study or just looking at what population was included for the ARRIVE trial. So I have some important variables um, here listed out. And so in the first column um, for ARRIVE induction group, the average or the median age was 24. Um, and you can see BMI and the racial breakdown. When you compare that to the BI deliveries, um, BI has a slightly older population. Um, I didn't have great data about BMI and a slightly different racial breakdown. So again, this is just pointing out that we probably have a slightly different population than what was studied in the ARRIVE trial. In 2018, there were about 5,200 5, deliveries. Um, those that were done among nulliparous singleton greater than or equal to 39 weeks were about 1,500. From the data I had, I excluded those who weren't, had known medical issues like diabetes or hypertension or those that went into spontaneous labor in the time period in which in the study they had been induced. So I didn't want to include people who were laboring at that point. And I came up with a group that was potentially eligible for induction of labor greater than 39 weeks of about 1,000. I then looked at what the actual type of labor was. And so of that group, about 515 were induced and 517 ultimately went into spontaneous labor. When I looked at the inductions, at least here in that um, year, the majority of inductions had indications develop. And so presumably the inductions were performed for maternal or fetal indications and not electively. The cesarean delivery in this group was 32.8%. And the mean gestational age of delivery of the induction and spontaneous laboring group was about 40 weeks. And again, this is not, I'm not replicating the trial here, but really just trying to understand who are we already inducing and who could we potentially include um, for inductions. And so of the 1,000 people who are eligible, um, if we induced all of those people um, at you know 39 weeks, like the sort of elective induction for all at that point, then that would be about 500 more inductions annually based on historical data. And if you think about only 30% accepting, potentially 150 more inductions annually. So not that many, but um, but you know definitely a bit more. And also I wanted to look at how the length of stay would would change. And so I know that. Um, on average, our patients, all comers who come to the BI, there's 
about 18 hours spent on labor and delivery. And so this would move um, the average to 18.6 hours, so just slightly longer. I also, this is the chart from the cost effectiveness analysis. And um, so I wanted to kind of apply the what I found to be the induction of labor rate of cesarean. Um, and again, this is that's people who had maternal fetal indications and weren't um, necessarily the same group included in the ARRIVE trial, but just for illustrative purposes. So at a rate of about 32%, um, you can see that in the majority of scenarios, induction would not necessarily be cost effective. So in general at the BI, we try to accommodate elective inductions if we can, but the official process is that requests are sent to labor and delivery, decisions for approval will occur within 24 hours, requests for inductions for nulliparous patients prior to 41 weeks without a medical indication may be denied, um, and elective induction has not been found to increase the risk of cesarean, but does occupy additional resources on labor and delivery, and so we cannot uniformly accommodate those requests. My observation is that we're starting to do more elective inductions. Um, so it's definitely something that if it's requested, it's looked at, and if it can be accommodated, it, it is. So some conclusion, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about counseling. Induction is not associated with a higher rate of cesarean delivery or worse perinatal outcomes among low-risk nulliparous patients. The findings of ARRIVE may differ locally, and so important questions include, is ARRIVE generalizable to the population at my institution? Can the induction be supported by staff and resources? And that may be a moving target. Um, and is it cost effective based on the cost of induction, which likely varies based on your institution? Also think it's very important to um, employ shared decision making and informed consent as you know, many people do not quite understand what an induction of labor is when they're choosing that, um, but trying to help our patients understand what it means and kind of the risks and benefits is, is another important piece of this. That brings me to counseling. So one part of it is, first of all, talk, uh, deciding does my patient fit the criteria used in the study? And that's what most of, at least at this point, our governing bodies are indicating we should do. And so that, again, was nulliparous, singleton, vertex um, pregnancies, and no medical indication for induction. If there is a medical indication, that kind of puts us in a different category, and the counseling is not the same. And then, you know, what are the benefits of induction? So potentially a lower rate of cesarean delivery and hypertension, and also having a little bit more control over timing. What are some of the downsides? may require continuous monitoring. There's likely would to be more interventions and more prolonged time on labor and delivery. So a couple more take home points. Again, the RAD trial applies only to low risk nulliparous patients. Many patients may not actually want an elective induction, um, but patients can be reassured that induction does not increase cesarean rate. So I just want to thank all the people who helped to put this talk together and help me think about it and, um, and all of my attendings and co-fellows. And with that, now I'll take some questions. One question I got um, was, could you explain what you mean by expectant management group? Are they... Hold on. Are they letting women go to 42 weeks? So. Um, the expectant, so when you're faced with someone at 39 weeks, and in this trial, they kind of randomized people between 38 and 38 and 6, and the groups were either to induce between 39 and 39 and 4 weeks, or to just wait and see what happens. And so in that group, they um, at least specified that they, they couldn't be induced prior to 40 and 5 weeks, but there may have been something that developed in that group, which ultimately led to an induction later. And so they cut off 42 and 2 as they needed to um, kind of be induced by that time period. And so that's where that came from. But the, yes, in the study and in the different populations, they were letting people go to that point. But anytime they might have ultimately been induced or they may have gone into labor on their own. So another question or comment was, um, does the six hour difference 
surprise you. Anecdotally, induction seems to take significantly longer than spontaneous labor. Yeah, I think I would have expected it to be longer, but I think one important thing to recognize is that the groups, you know, probably also included inductions in the expectant management group, and it's a median, um, and there was, you know, a range. So um, I think overall, it, it, I, I agree. I think that inductions do take longer, but again, like there may have been a significant amount of inductions that ultimately happened in the expectant management group. And it's just overall on average. In your group at BI, was your rate of C-section for the induced patients different than the expectant group? So in those people who were induced versus spontaneous free labor, I think they were. Um, I have to say, I don't think I calculated the cesarean delivery rate for the spontaneously laboring group. Yeah, I mostly, I mean, I identified those in the different groups, so I probably, it's probably something I could go back and look at, and I think um, in general it is, it is, I would expect it to be lower. Um, our overall, our cesarean delivery rate is about 23%, so certainly, oh, sorry, the NTSV rate, which includes people from 37 and on, because all term, um, is about 23%, so if we extrapolate that and include just people 39 and beyond, it's probably about the same. So overall, our rate is lower than what I reported for the induced group. Thank you for those that joined and for um, the questions.